Welcome back. It was about a decade ago that Canadian David St. Jacques was told that he had been selected to be an astronaut on the International Space Station. The years since have tested his mettle, his family, and most recently his nerve, because the last crew to attempt the trip didn't make it when a sensor on the Soyuz failed, causing an emergency landing. So that meant the next in line crew moved up, David's. So as WFI's Peter Ackman shows us, years of counting down are down to about two weeks. Just 400 kilometers straight up on the edges of Earth's atmosphere is the only human outpost in space. A fragile and dangerous scientific home base, the International Space Station has been a rare and invaluable perch for the world's astronauts. The most beautiful thing about space exploration is the broadening of our perspective, broadening of the human comprehension of where we're coming from and where we're going to. And I can't wait to for that view to be in my face. Fewer than 250 astronauts from 17 countries have called the ISS home. Canadian David Saint-Jacques will soon be among that elite group. He'll be spending six and a half months aboard, conducting dozens of scientific experiments, all while orbiting the planet more than 27,000 kilometers an hour. Do you think you'll find peace in the ISS? I think so. I'm blessed in the sense that my, I have this mission uh, that I can apply all my talents to. And also to understand something about our world and what it means to live here on this planet. To earn the right to go, Saint-Jacques has spent nearly a decade in intensive training. Stay in school, buddy. And recently he's become the public face for the Canadian Space Agency. Thank you. Today's mission, talking space travel with an auditorium full of eager young scientists. So the reason we have a space station is we use it to understand a whole lot about the planet, about ourselves. St. Jacques' own fascination with space also began at a young age, growing up outside of Montreal. You're a kid from St. Lambert, Quebec. Did you ever imagine you'd be wearing a jumpsuit with the Canadian patch on your sleeve? I've always had a fantasy of space flight. I've always been fascinated by space. But for most of my life, I never really thought it was even an option. Uh, like some kids fantasize of being a medieval knight or a samurai, uh, but at some point you gotta pick a real job. For Saint Jacques, thinking practically meant first getting an engineering degree, then a PhD in astrophysics, and finally graduating to become a medical doctor. Why? an astronaut on top of it all. There's no great master plan in there, you know. It's just one thing led to another. I guess as a child, I was initially interested on figuring out how, how do things work? How do machines work? And then eventually, how does the universe work? Then space has always been this star in the distance that I walk towards. Then that star got a whole lot closer. In 2008, while he was working as a doctor in an Inuit community in the high Arctic, St. Jacques found out that the Canadian Space Agency was holding a once-in-a-lifetime competition to recruit astronauts. It was suddenly that childhood fantasy was a practical option, a very, very slim chance, but it was non-zero, so I felt like I owed it to the, the child in me to, to try. Immediately, Saint-Jacques applied, along with more than 5,000 others. After a series of cuts, he was among the top 40 remaining. They would be put through a final rigorous series of tests, pushing them to the limits, facing one life-threatening scenario after another. Within months, Saint-Jacques came out on top. Jeremy Hansen and David Saint-Jacques. Chosen as one of Canada's two newest astronauts. Honestly, every test that I had to go through, I felt, ooh, my God, this was difficult. Since that moment nine years ago, Saint-Jacques has been crisscrossing the planet, training non-stop. His new home base is here in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. Then in 2016, Saint-Jacques got the call. He was selected to go to the ISS with his specific mission now known, his training shifted. A major part is learning to survive outside the space station. 
To do that, St. Jacques would spend hours here in NASA's neutral buoyancy pool. Take that path and then come down to this Good. handle that I'm pointing at right there. Yeah, that's what you've been working on. The underwater landscape mimicking the effects of zero gravity during a spacewalk. Okay, so this is a good position okay. for you. What's been the hardest part about this preparation? The most challenging part has been to juggle. It's one thing to be a good astronaut, but it's something else to be do that and remain a good father and a good husband and a good friend and a good son to, to all these people that are important in my life. Opportunities like this one are rare. A single weekend, six months before his scheduled departure, the last time Saint-Jacques was able to spend at the family cottage in Oka, Quebec, far away from his grueling schedule, time with the people he loves the most. His wife, Veronique, their baby girl, Sophie, and their two sons, Pierre and Léon. This is our kind of our last uh, absolutely free time together. It's going to go in, my, in the suitcase in my head uh, as, I, as I leave for space. The hardest part is transitions. We've been doing that now for two and a half years of training and back and forth between Russia and Japan and, and Germany. And so it's those transitions, saying goodbye, saying hello, saying goodbye again, saying hello. And that requires constant adaptation. A doctor herself, Veronique, has had to be both mother and father to their children. Saint-Jacques is constantly traveling to train. And soon, with the launch date approaching, he won't even be on the planet. But Veronique reassures us, and herself, she's not worried. I know that the safety of the crew is the priority. So to me, it's not the risk, it's how you, how you make the effort to impact that risk and mitigate that risk. Um, I would be really pissed if David texted on the highway, uh, but I'm okay with him flying a rocket. <laughs> Without that trust, Saint-Jacques admits his mission would be a failure. It's impossible to find the peace of mind and the, uh, the bandwidth to prepare for a space mission if you don't have strong support at home and if you don't have a practical but also emotional support. We're all in this together, and that's really the basis of my support team, is, is my family. One person who knows all too well about the challenges of space flight and marriage, the last Canadian to go to space, Chris Hatfield. This is ground control to Major Tom. You've really made the grade. By far, he's Canada's most well-known astronaut. So here's a soaking wet washcloth, and now let's, let's start wringing it His out. His tweets and videos have reached and inspired millions around the world. It's becoming a tube of water. Even five years after returning to Earth, Hadfield is still in high demand by his followers and fans. These two, someone? Uh, yeah, Daniel. Okay. I'm delighted David is the next Canadian to fly in space. I helped select him uh, during the selection process. He and Veronique phoned me one day and they talked to me for the better part of an hour on the phone talking about what, you know, what's it like, what can we expect, how much of a change in our lives will it be, what, what are the goods, what are the bads and all that. And uh, the multifaceted nature of their lives and David's capabilities, I think, are going to help reflect space flight in a way that none of us has up until now. But you did set the bar unbelievably high in sort of turning people back on to space. Um, is that a hard act to follow? It is an immensely technically challenging place, psychologically challenging place. Uh, you're there on behalf of seven and a half billion people and researchers all around the world. Your life is enormously busy. And then occasionally you will try and find time to share it in an entertaining manner. But David uh, is a far more scientifically apt and trained person than I am and the work that he can do on behalf of the medical community in Canada is far more significant than what I could do. Are you good at playing the guitar? I'm not. Are, are you good at Twitter? <laughs> what are you gonna do when you're up there that gets the world's attention, gets Canada's attention? I think the, uh, the right way to look at this is to say that the, uh, 
We're not sending robots to space for a good reason. We're sending people. And we're sending people because what we want, what everybody's curious about, what everybody really wants to know is the human experience. What is it to be up there and to look at the planet and to look at space and to live uh, in the environment of space? And the only way to do this well is to be yourself. But for Saint-Jacques and every other astronaut making the treacherous journey to space, all that comes a distant second to survival. Are you scared about this mission? Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, I'd be naive if I wasn't scared. Now, this is dangerous. Putting your life on the line. Space is hard, and that's why we have to train hard. For the most dangerous job in the world. You try and squeeze every last bit of benefit out of the risk taking so that it's worth it. When W5 continues. Five, four, three, two, one. Engines at maximum thrust, off. Blasting off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan in October, this mission was just supposed to be another launch of a Russian Soyuz rocket bound for the International Space Station. The final launch before Canadian David Saint-Jacques and his team were scheduled to go. Good on board and we are feeling well. And then the ordinary, took a terrible turn. Just two minutes in, near disaster. Stand by, emergency. The failure of the booster. Please. Ballistic descent command is sent from root controller, Bobby. Forcing the two crew members to abort. Amazingly, no one was injured. But the unexplained failure immediately put all other missions on hold. Saint-Jacques, who had been watching that day, was left in limbo. Is there a little bit of nervous creep that comes in when you see that? Because, yes, you've trained for it, mm -hmm. but to see it live right before your eyes. You know, it is, I guess, a sobering reminder that space is hard, and that's why we have to train hard. That's why we have to spend all these hours practicing, you know, catastrophic scenarios. But the Soyuz missions weren't grounded for long. Just three weeks later, Russian investigators cleared Saint-Jacques for takeoff, concluding a faulty sensor was to blame for the crash. For you, having your hands on the thing that's propelling you into space is an advantage. It gives you peace of mind? Yeah. The more I know about the spacecraft and the system, and the more I know personally the people involved in it, uh, the better I feel about it, yeah. Instilling even more confidence, David Saint-Jacques and his crewmates, Russian cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko and American astronaut Anne McLean, are training for that exact scenario. In this simulation, the team is tasked with safely maneuvering their Soyuz capsule in a ballistic descent back to Earth under emergency conditions, just like the last aborted launch. Monitoring this test are the same Russian scientists who worked on the last mission. The three astronauts are squeezed tightly together inside the capsule. Despite the intense heat, changing variables and mounting pressure, the team is perfect. It is very intimate, yeah. You, you, gotta, you gotta work together well. We actually. Interesting, we barely see each other's face, we just see each other's hands working on common on the same uh, control panel, so it is a bit of a symbol of teamwork. All of this training is taking place just 25 kilometers east of Moscow. A secret Russian space complex that for decades never appeared on a single map. It's called Star City. Nearly 60 years since being built, not much has changed. Despite its crumbling buildings and overrun vegetation, it's still the best place to train for the dangers of space. You're at your second home. You're back at home in Russia. This is strange, yeah, but it has grown on me like this. Uh, I feel like I've had over the last two years these, these two parallel lives going on, you know? Sometimes I catch myself when I go at the, I'm at the airport in Houston. Yeah. 
always the same gate. It's like the hourglass in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. You know, I'm stepping into my other life, my Russian life, and I become Russian David, and I dress differently, and I eat differently, and I'm here speaking a different language and studying different things. The Cosmonaut Training Center is a remnant from the Cold War, when the world was on the brink. Home to the brightest Soviet scientists during the space race, it's now named after Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space. In 1961, he completed one full orbit of the Earth. Since then, Gagarin's achievements and other monumental triumphs of the Russian space program have been celebrated in every corner of the country. Even in the center of power, fallen space heroes are honored, their names engraved on the walls outside the Kremlin. After the fall of communism in 1991, a new era of international cooperation led to the construction of the space station. Liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Canadian and American astronauts continue to launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But all that changed in 2011 when the U.S. government shelved its shuttle program, leaving astronauts without a ride up to the International Space Station. That's where Russia stepped in, and it even provided the training. But they'd have to travel here to Star City. Former right. American astronaut Doug Wheelock is now director of NASA operations in Star City. Without the Russians and the Soyuz, where would space uh, We would not have a space station. So uh, we would have a space station, but we'd have no people on it. For St. Jacques, Kononenko, and McLean, they feel as a team, there's nothing they can't handle. What makes this team click? You know, David and Oleg I have the most, uh, most respect for. And, you know, I look at David and his, his educational history, his work experience, everything is, is phenomenal. And he is a hero, a superstar, but it's because of the small decisions that he makes mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And I see the person he is under stress, and I have the utmost respect for that. But their faith in each other will be tested in the unforgiving conditions of space. 32 meters. In fact, just six hours into the mission, St. Jacques will be relied on to safely dock the Soyuz capsule and the crew with the ISS. I confirm contact. In space, it's like a ballet on fingertips. And so David is very, very uh, well tuned. He's got the hands of a surgeon, so he's got a very, very uh, light, very, very commanding touch on the control systems, and he'll be a great space flyer. What's your relationship like with David? I trust in his uh, skills and his knowledge, and uh, he's a good guy. We act as a one team, and we've been training as a one team, and we do really rely on each other. I think that international aspect is one of the crucial signs of the World Space Program, the fact that we do this together as a whole humanity. Even though there are undeniable political tensions, somehow, through the magic of space exploration, we keep working together. And as a father, I like to, it gives me hope. It gives me hope that humans have this in themselves. The trio has spent years rigorously preparing for every possible life-threatening scenario in space. The newest challenge, contain and stop a simulated ammonia leak on the International Space Station. They're working in this massive hangar on a full-size replica of the Russian modules of the ISS. Every switch, wire and window exactly the same. You're ready? You feel ready, right? You, you've got the spark. You seem ready. I am ready. I feel ready. I mean, I know I got a couple more exams to go through and a, a bit more training to go through, but the bulk of it, uh, I'm ready to go. Just as important as the technical and safety training scenarios, the team also prepares for the psychological and physical challenges of space travel. You'll physically be depleted quickly as, you, as you're up there. If you're not careful, you can quickly become very weak and your bones lose their strength, your immune system goes haywire, your cardiovascular system gets all out of balance. But we're good now. We spent a lot of effort trying to mitigate that. Former Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield knows firsthand the effects 
space on his body. There's definitely a cost to weightlessness, but there's a cost to whatever you do. And you're all gonna die eventually anyway. The real question is, uh, what do you do while you're alive? But just weeks before the team finally blasts off, Saint-Jacques admits his thoughts have strayed to those bigger questions of human existence. We spend most of our energy surviving and building houses that don't collapse and you know, healing people who are sick and keeping the world going. If that's all we were doing, that wouldn't be enough for the human soul. With a little bit of energy we have left, we do three things. We do the arts, mm -hmm. we do science, and we do exploration. And that's how we step by step slowly left the caves. We have to keep a little bit of our energy for blue sky dreaming. NW5 continues in a moment.